All right, so last week, uh, we, uh, we started uh, just kind of doing an overview of this discipling book by Mark Dever. Uh, we're going to continue to look at some of these concepts that he's got in here. In fact, I think, I think it's probably going to be good for us just to uh, stay here uh, together for a little while, work through some of these concepts. And I've also got another resource on discipleship that I think is going to be very beneficial. It's called uh, Proactive Discipleship, and it's by a gentleman named uh, Darren Roberts. Uh, Darren uh, was at Grace Emanuel Bible Church down in Jupiter, Florida for a number of years. And he has now gone to uh, the Houston area to plant a church there. Uh, Darren is a, is a great pastor and a very, very talented speaker, but also a faithful brother. And uh, his, his uh, resource is helpful as well. And what I, actually want, what I actually want to do is I want to put that resource in y'all's hands. So be looking for that in the future. I'm going to have that for you. Uh, but as we walk through this, this concept of discipleship, uh, I want to I want to come back to it and just kind of define for us what are we talking about here? Uh, if if we're going to talk about discipleship, if we're going to talk about discipling others, then what what are we talking about? What does it mean? What is a definition? For Mark Dever's purposes in his book, he says this: discipling is this. It is deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ deliberately doing spiritual good to someone so that he or she will be more like Christ. That's a pretty good definition. Uh, do we do deliberate good to others in the Christian life? How do we do that? How do we do deliberate good to others in a discipleship perspective? But we meet needs if there's a need physically and then probably especially the spiritual need, we, uh, we try to come alongside, and we should, and uh, do that. Encouragement. Amen. So meeting, meeting a physical need, an act of love, act of service uh, to a brother or sister in Christ, and then meeting a spiritual need. Uh, how is it that, how is it, what, what are some spiritual needs, first of all, that, that we may need to meet that are... Uh, that we recognize in our brother or sister's life. What are spiritual needs? Could be dealing with something that seems to overwhelm them. And I think we all have something in our past, maybe not in our past, in our present, that we struggle with and deal with. And we think we're the only ones that are dealing with that particular issue. You know, it's so, a lot of times just exposing that, just sharing that with somebody, you know. I remember someone came to me one time, they were sharing that, and I just I started laughing, and they, you know, they gave me a weird look like, hey brother, I'm trying to share with your laugh. I said, I'm laughing because I went through that a few years ago, and I had no idea why I went through that, I said. And, uh, but lo and behold, we, you know, because a lot of the things that we deal with and have through the power of the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, have been able to conquer those things. There's a reason for that. And a lot of times it's down the road to help somebody else deal with the exact same thing that they're going through. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so an overwhelming situation. It could be a trial, right? Mm -hmm. An overwhelming situation could be a trial. It could be hardship. It could be loss. Um, or it could just be a... My particular issue was was a misunderstanding of a biblical principle. Mm. Thinking, well, why does this keep coming back? And mm. what, what's the issue here? And understanding, and being able to understand that um, was was a real blessing. Amen. Amen. What else? A sense of connection. Sometimes people just need to feel like there's someone else there. And we can offer that to them uh, by being present, by listening, by trying to project God's principles uh, just in our, our sense of being, being there for them. Being a support, a support for them, uh, a crutch in the sense of, of ministering God's word uh, to them in, in times of hardship. Absolutely. That's what the church is for. 
Anything else come to your mind as we think about spiritual needs, meeting spiritual needs? We can pray for you. Mm-hmm. Prayer. Yeah. And and that that should be really the tip of our spear, right? And we can pray with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Prayer should always be the first go to. <laughs> um, when when you know, whether it's a person who's who's feeling alone, whether it's a person who's dealing with an overwhelming situation, whether it's a person who's caught in in some sort of ensnaring sin, um, once we become aware of it, these are all spiritual needs that need to be uh, ministered to. But once we become aware of it, the, the first thing that we should go to always is prayer. Uh, that, that's such a that's such an important part of uh, of the Christian life because. When we go to the Lord first in prayer, what we're doing is we are recognizing that God is sovereign over this situation. And and God is sovereign over this person's issues. He's sovereign over this person's even transformation according to the power of the Holy Spirit. And so even though we may have answers for them, because we know where the answers are, they're in God's Word. and, and, And we've perhaps even experienced what they're going through and and can speak to that from our own life experience according to that truth prayer recognizes uh, well anything that i have to say is irrelevant if the lord doesn't work so the lord must work the lord must work in their heart the lord must be the one who gives ultimate uh support the world, the, the Lord must be the one who brings ultimate peace. The Lord must be the one who overcomes enslaving sin. Uh, he's the one that's going to do it according to his truth and his power. And so prayer is a recognition of that. And it's so vital. It's so important. Uh, we cannot minister to the needs of others without it. So those are all great, excellent, excellent points that you guys have made. Um, I want to kind of bring us back to the very foundation though this morning. Let's turn to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, very, very uh, familiar passage that we're gonna look at real quick here, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The reason why I wanna go back to this is because this is the foundational mission of God's church. This is what God has established for the church to be doing. Therefore, this is what God has established for us who are in the church to be about. This is, this is what our focus is, is the Great Commission. But wrapped up in the Great Commission is our topic that we're talking about this morning. So does somebody want to read verses 18 through 20, Matthew 28? I will. Okay. Uh, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and earth and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, thank you. So what's the very first thing that we're called to do in this commission? Go. And then there is a connecting command with the go. What's the what's that? Go and teach. Make disciples. Make disciples, right? Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Okay. So we've got a command. We've got an imperative. It's uh, it's actually you you could say discipleize in the in the Greek uh, is is how this actually kind of comes forth. It is. It is to transform, to, to make disciples, make followers. Um, but first, before we can do that, we have to make absolutely certain that we are disciples, right? Um, you can't make disciples unless you're a disciple. Uh, this, is a, this is a continuing command that builds off of what Christ has already done. Christ called men to himself. He called them to come and follow him. He called them to follow him with his with their lives, to lay down their lives and to take up their cross and to commit to, to leading this life of discipleship uh, until their death. This is what a disciple is. And so let's just define that real clearly. What is a disciple 
In fact, this term, disciple, in the New Testament, a disciple is someone who follows another. Someone who follows another. Now, the, the word there, mathetus, the root of this word points to the mental effort needed to think something through. So this is about learning. Uh, that's, that's where the root comes from. It, it, is a, it is a seeking out knowledge, a seeking out learning. So to be a mathetus, a disciple, is to be a learner. It is to receive instruction. A disciple is someone who follows a teacher, deriving learning from the teacher's knowledge and modeling how the teacher applies that knowledge in life. In the Jewish world, a disciple would voluntarily join a school or otherwise seek out a master rabbi. A man is then called a disciple when he binds himself to a teacher, to someone else, in order to acquire his practical and theoretical knowledge. This may come in the form of an apprentice in a trade, a student of medicine, a member of a philosophical school, or any number of other areas. But a disciple is someone who is learning, someone who's learning. And the way that they're learning is by following another, following the model, you could say, the model of the knowledge that, that they want to bring to themselves. That's what a disciple is. This concept of discipleship applied in the New Testament then becomes synonymous with being a Christian. A Christian is a disciple. A Christian is a follower of Christ who learns the doctrines of Scripture and the lifestyle that these doctrines require. That is a little bit different of a definition than what some people think of when they use the term Christian today, right? For sure. What what are some what are some popular ways that we have redefined what being a Christian is in our society? I go to church. I go to church. Doing good things. Doing good things. Yeah, external works. Daily devotions. Doing daily devotions. Okay. I haven't really done anything wrong. I haven't really so done I anything wrong. Real, something really big. So I'm a good person in yeah. general. Yeah, I must be a Christian then. Prayer. I pray. I was born into My a Christian were family. Christians, therefore, yeah. I'm a Christian. Right. Yeah, yeah, same one. Yeah, yeah, you've got relational Christianity. Uh, I am a Christian. Yep, yeah. Uh, for, for me, it was I uh, said a prayer and I got baptized. I did the thing I was supposed to do. So that makes me a Christian, right? But for me, I was not a Christ follower. See, I, I checked off the boxes that would get me into heaven when I died. But then from the time that I got the box checked off to, to the time that I was going to go into heaven, I was going to live for myself. I was going to make the most of it. And the theology that, that I learned as a child allowed for that. Um, call it carnal, the carnal Christian. The carnal Christian is someone who has said some sort of prayer, made some sort of intellectual decision, and, and aligned themselves with the moral standards of Christianity in one way or another, but then fallen away from that and are now living however they want to. But because they checked off the box, that means that they're good when they die. In fact, that's what they'll tell you. Don't worry about me. I'm good. I'm fine. I've got that taken care of. But that's a foreign concept to the New Testament. That, that is not what Christianity is. Christians were first disciples. They were first and foremost followers of Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Somebody want to read verses 18 through 22 for us? I will. Okay. <coughs> now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. 
Going on from there, he saw <coughs> two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, what's interesting to notice here and, and just really take in is that these men were fishermen by trade. Uh, this was their job. This was their livelihood. And in the first century, if you didn't have some sort of livelihood, there wasn't really a welfare system that you could fall back on. Uh, there wasn't government housing and, and projects and all that sort of stuff and food stamps and everything else. Uh, you couldn't just go live on the street and expect to get a handout from anybody that you came across. In this, in this time period, if you didn't have some sort of livelihood, the, it was very, it was a very uh, real situation that you and your family could be put out and starved to death, or you could be sold into slavery to pay off your debts. Uh, it is not like the time that we lived in today. And so these men were fishermen. They, they had learned to be fishermen, probably from their fathers, maybe from an apprenticeship that they had had with other men who were fishermen, but they had learned this trade and it was by this trade that they fed their families and by this trade that they made their money and this was their livelihood. And, and some of these men did have families. And so Jesus coming to these men and saying, follow me is essentially saying, look, leave everything that you know behind. Leave your livelihood behind. Leave your source of comfort behind and come and follow after me with this uh, mission that I'm about to accomplish. Come and be my disciple. Learn from me. And they understood that. They understood, they understood that he was a teacher. They understood that he had the truth to minister to them. And so for them, that was more important than their livelihood. And they trusted him. So they followed him. So that concept of, of leaving everything behind to follow Christ in, in this journey, a journey that they were now embarking on that would rest, last the rest of their lives and would lead many of them to their deaths, uh, that's what they were committing to. And so for us today, when we, when we follow Christ, when we trust in Him, do we really understand what it is that we are committing to? Are we willing to leave it all behind, lay it all down, for the sake of following him. Turn over to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. I'll read this one. It says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So what does discipleship cost? What does it cost? Everything. Everything? <coughs> One life for another. One life for One another. Life and another life. <coughs> what else? Luke even goes harder on that. It defines a little more. He says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brother, sister, yes, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. We I mean, know in context, but you love them less than the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's a hard saying. Because many people, they can't get to that point. They'll, they'll forsake what God has called them to do over family. We've seen that. And yeah, so it's a hard say. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and, and on one side of it, salvation is free, right? 
Now, we receive salvation solely by the grace of God, but discipleship costs everything. So the following of Him means that we are willing to lay down everything, relationships, career, uh, possessions, even our life. We are willing to lay down everything for the sake of Christ, put it all away to follow Him. And so coming, coming back to where we first started, we must understand this because in order to make disciples, that, that very fir- the very first part, in order to go therefore and make disciples, we have to be disciples, but we also have to be able to communicate what discipleship is. We have to be able to communicate to the lost that listen, this is following Christ. This is turning from a lifestyle of sin and turning to following Jesus as Lord. That's what discipleship is. That's what being a Christian is. And if you are going to be a Christian, this is what you must do. And that is an impossibility. So you can only come to Christ through the transformation of the Holy Spirit within your heart. God does the work Therefore, you follow him. That's what discipleship is. So if we're going to make disciples, that's the message that we have to preach to them. That's the message that we have to take to the world. So that brings us to the question, can a person be a Christian and yet not be a disciple? Can a person be saved and not follow Jesus as Lord? Can they? saved? That's the question, right? That's the question. And now there may be people that you run across in life, and and I can think of many in in my life, who they say they're Christians, maybe they go to church, maybe they pray some, uh, maybe they do some of these other things that you guys mentioned, but when you look at their lifestyle, when you look at the trajectory of their life, you can see very clearly this person is a me follower and not a Christ follower. And so there may be a time that you ask that person, that you bring that to light and you say, listen, you, you, you say that you're a Christian, but do you understand being a Christian is not simply about some external actions and it's not about something that maybe you did back in your past it is about what you're doing right now. It is about the trajectory of your life. Can you honestly say you are following Christ, that you're following Jesus as Lord right now in your life with your life's decisions? Can you honestly say that? And posing that question to them perhaps may be the truth the Lord uses to bring them to Him. Now, it may also be the truth that God uses to harden them even further and turn them away from your counsel. Uh, That's just the reality of it. But at the end of the day, you can step back and you can say, I was faithful to give them the truth because I love them. And if you can say that, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Because once again, back to prayer, we are not the ones who are in control of the outcome, right? We can't control the outcome. We can't control other people. But God, through his power, can transform the hardest heart through the speaking of the truth of the gospel. So, the first part of the Great Commission, go and make disciples, it means teaching people what discipleship actually is. Okay, so let's say that we've done that. Let's say that we've preached that message. And let's say that a person has come to know Christ. So, so they've come to accept Him. Has this commission been fulfilled in their life? That's where it starts. <laughs> That's where it starts. That's where it starts. Great point. Uh, the act of fulfilling God's directive to the church, it is an ongoing commitment to discipleship. Teaching all those in the church to obey everything that Christ has commanded, everything that Christ has handed down to us. That's what the Great Commission says, right? We're to go make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we're bringing them into the local church. We're baptizing them, public profession of faith, in, in, in the witness of the church, which means churches have to be there. So churches have to be established in order for that to be the case. And then within those churches, we are teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded in his word. Now that for us today is the completed canon of scripture. From cover to cover, it is the Bible, Old and New Testament. We are teaching disciples to obey everything that has been presented in the word of God. Can we do that in a week? No. <laughs> How about a month? How about a lifetime? Yeah. Yes. We might get somewhere in a lifetime, but we're probably still not going to teach them everything that needs to be known because I don't know everything that needs to be known in here. Maybe some of you do. Um, if you do, you can teach me. But for all of us, this goes two ways. If we're disciples of Christ, then this is, number one, for me personally, a lifetime of personal commitment to studying God's Word, to, to, to mining out the riches and the truth that are in God's Word, and conforming my life, my mind, my actions to the truth of God's Word. And then it's also turning and helping other people, other believers in the church to also do the same. Helping them to learn the fullness of the truth of God's Word, conforming their minds and their lifestyle to it. That's what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is a lifelong commitment to discipleship, and it is a reciprocating mission, meaning that as Jesus called his apostles to make disciples and teach them to obey everything that he had commanded, they are then calling new disciples, teaching them to obey everything that he commanded, which includes the going out and making of disciples. So the Great Commission is a constantly reciprocating process, and it's not going to be fulfilled in its culmination until that last day, until Christ completes all things. And so that's our work. That's what we're called to do. And it's a work that isn't completed until that day. And so this is what we are to be about. Now, what that means for us is that we can't simply be Lone Ranger Christians. Uh, Christians can't exist outside a local church. Well, you can try, but you're going to starve to death. You're not going to have the support system. You're going to be drawn by the Spirit back to the church. True Christians, as we've seen in 1 John 5, 1 through 5, true Christians love other Christians. They want to be in fellowship with other Christians. People who are false Christians, they don't want to be in the local church where there's accountability and truth being taught. They don't want to be there, and so they separate themselves from it, or they jump from one to the other. Or if the, minute, the minute a person's heart-level issues get exposed, and they're not a true believer, they're going to run. They're going to go somewhere else. And that's why you see so much church hopping happening today. In Mark Dever's book, he says, Christianity is not for loners or individualists. It's for people traveling together down the narrow path that leads to life. That's what Christianity is. It, it is the narrow path that we're walking together, helping one another become more like Christ. And not only that, but in order for us to be a church that is about fulfilling the Great Commission, we must likewise be a church that is about discipleship. In order for a church that's been planted in a region that needed a healthy church like this place right here, in order for us to be a Great Commission church, a church that is about fulfilling this mission, we must first be a disciple-making church that is then continuing this discipleship process in all of our lives. That's what it means to be a Great Commission church. <laughs> And so if you think about that from the very beginning of, of how Desert Ridge Baptist Church got started, there was a desire placed on men's hearts to see a sound church planted in this area. Uh, there is a famine of sound doctrine in this area. 
And I'm not saying that there's not any churches that aren't teaching sound doctrine here. There are some. But what I'm saying is, compared to the rest of the United States, this is the least evangelical place in this, in this country. And so there was a desire on men's hearts to come here and make certain that the Great Commission was happening here. Pastor Michael came out. Uh, Pastor Keith Sanders uh, had come out here several times and desired to support a mission here. DRBC was planted as a result of all of that. Desert Ridge Baptist Church has resulted, the ministry of Desert Ridge Baptist Church has resulted in salvation uh, in people's lives. It's resulted in discipleship in people's lives. And now the Great Commission falls on this church to go therefore make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that Christ commanded, which goes out from here out to the ends of the earth. But in order to do that, it starts right here. You see, this is also a place that was initiated and planted to be a center of discipleship because that's what the Great Commission is all about. So it's not just about initial evangelism for us. It's not just about uh, growing in our knowledge of theology for the sake of theology. It is about committing to one another for the rest of our lives to be involved in this discipleship process. Learning the truth and applying it personally, taking the truth and applying it outwardly to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is what the mission that God has given us is all about. If we're doing that here, that, that then equips us to go out to the farthest reaches of the earth and reciprocate that process. So the, the, the goal then is to be totally committed to all of this right here at the RBC. I'm out of time. So let me close this in prayer. Lord, uh, we come to you facing a task that is impossible for us this commission that you've given your church it is one that we could never even begin to take part in unless you were to do the work and so Lord we confess this that, that we are simply objects to be used by you we confess that nothing will be accomplished under our own power and so Lord we ask you to work for you to be the power for you to bring the results and we ask you, Lord, that you would simply put us where you would have us to be in order for us to be a part of what you are doing. Lord, help us to be in fellowship with you in this work that you started from the very beginning. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.